And, now, I'm sure, and watching, it hasn't been easy at all. I mean, you didn't expect it to be easy serving in Congress, but what could have prepared you for MAGA? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, a lot of times what people see is my um, legal background coming out. You know, I consistently had to show up in a courtroom and I had to show up and I was usually the underdog because when you're on the defense and the state has everything, you know, they got the detectives, they got investigators, they got the prosecutors. And then it's like little old you and your client, right? Like, I mean, it is it is tough. And, and it is, uh, it's, and a lot of times they got the judges too, but nevertheless, like it's, it's very tough. And so I've always had to punch back and fight back and fight really, really hard for something that I believed in, which right. usually was my client. Um, and so being in this very aggressive atmosphere, I'm actually used to a lot of aggression. Like I know how to deal with it. I just thought that I wouldn't get as much aggression in, in Congress. <laughs> so last night, of course, everyone was looking forward to the, the Obamas, of course. They, yeah. You know, love Michelle, love Barack. But Monday, Secretary Clinton, uh, AOC, and then you. And I tell you what, um, how did it feel? Were you nervous? First of all, were you nervous to go out in front of? This sounds like this is the home of Michael Jordan. He won these championships here, and I'm sure uh, the, the crowd noise went to the roof. But the other night, I felt like Michael Jordan won another championship when you got up there. Um, how were you nervous at all? And what was it like um, being on that platform discussing? Kamala Harris and discussing the villain. So I'm gonna tell you, um, I don't get nervous. I don't get nervous. Uh, I was I was just explaining that uh, I was at Broccoli City Fest and there were 50,000 concert goers and here it is. Yeah, I'm a broccoli lover now, by the way. I gotta tell you, I'm, I became a broccoli lover after seeing you there. But go ahead. Um, and I wasn't nervous at all, right? Like, and this is the place where, like, nobody wants to see a politician. They came to see everybody, like, rap and sing and do all the things. But I was nervous as, as hell for two hours before this speech. Okay. Like, like I was I was losing it. Yeah. Um, and my staff has never seen me get nervous. Okay. And so they were like, do you need water? What do you need? I ended up with this headache. Um, I, was, I was really struggling. And I was struggling... Um, not because I didn't have confidence in the speech itself, but because I understood the gravity of the moment. Um, for me, this was like needing to deliver one of my best closing statements in one of the shortest amounts of time for one of the, the biggest clients I've ever had. And that is how I approached it. And so I knew that I did not want to disappoint her. Right. Um, I told the story of our initial interaction. Yeah, I was going to mention that. But it has not been our only interaction. And so I tell people all the time that I'm one of her favorites. Um, I say (laughs) that because that's how she makes people feel. And I usually ask people, especially when I'm going into a room of organizers or donors, I say, have you ever met her? And and I want to know who I'm dealing with because I'm like, if you meet her, you feel like like she your sis. Like she really checking for you and she just it's just great, right? Like, so she just makes everybody feel that way. You mentioned in your speech, too, um, that early on, she really helped you out. Yeah, no, like, like, seriously. And so that's, so I was, I was concerned about letting her down because the other side of this was that we can't find where another Black woman freshman has ever been allowed to address DNC, right. especially at prime Which time. I actually, why, why I actually, why are you nervous? <laughs> So I also was concerned about potentially failing and making it to where they say we can't ever risk doing that again with a rookie. Wow. Um, so, so you I was put a lot on your show. I did, I did. So I was, I was, I was getting like super duper worked up, and I could not unwork myself. And so um, I, I stood there as Jamie was on the stage. J- Jamie Raskin was delivering his words. And they messed up his teleprompter, so that only added to the nerves. And as I was standing there, um, I just bowed my head and I prayed. And I was like, God, I'm just asking that you use me and that you calm me down so that the people can hear the message. And so ultimately, um, I at the moment I walked on the stage, it was almost as if God gave me the biggest hug ever 
and I was I was good. Like as soon as I walked on and the crowd started cheering, it was like, and I was like, all right, I'm good. Like I'm I'm okay. good, and yeah. and I and I flowed from there. One of the things when when I talked about the pressure that I felt, one of the things that I want to be clear eyed about is the expectations, because electing a president um, like a Kamala Harris will not necessarily change your life the next day, and it necessarily won't fix everything. It's going to take more than that, right? What we've seen is that our our rights have been trampled upon by this Supreme Court, and we're stuck with it for a minute, right? And so. I want people to understand that we still have limitations because I don't want them to see this and say, well, she failed because she's going to need a house. She's going to need a Senate. And frankly, we got to figure out something about this Supreme Court as well to to begin to realize the fullness of the greatness that she could do in our lives. Now, as it relates to the systems and, and the institutions themselves, well, you can change who's at the top of these very systems. That is the beauty of being the president. We saw that we ended up with the secretary of HUD that was a black woman, Secretary Fudge, and the difference it made because from her perspective, she could see that when it comes to housing, they want to devalue our homes, which is then affecting our wealth or our generational wealth. You know, these are things that she understood. But when you have somebody that doesn't understand that, then the system is not going to be changed to make sure that it works for everybody. So when you can change who's at the top, even like tonight, we will hear from Secretary of Department of Transportation, Secretary Pete, he is a gay man. And so guess what? He knows what it is to have his rights trampled upon. So the Civil Rights Division still exists within the Department of Transportation right now. And because of crazy decisions that have come from the Supreme Court around an affirmative action and things like that, they have preemptively, which usually we are in a very responsive stance, decided to change some of the rules around what they call 8A, and AA really has to do with small businesses having an opportunity to participate. When we're talking about infrastructure, it ain't just about getting a better road. It's about making sure we know who's building on those roads and those airports and things like that and making sure that we are getting the contracts as well. And so it gets really deep. But the point is, if we are to succeed, we've got to have economic opportunities. And that is something that she will understand and she will make sure that whoever becomes the secretary of these various agencies will make that a priority, whether it's secretary of VA, whether it's the secretary of housing, whether it's secretary of department of transportation. And so we can start to make those changes, but I just want people to understand that nothing will happen overnight and y'all gotta give her a team. You gotta make sure that she has a Jasmine Crockett and a few others in the U.S. House to make sure that we can carry forward with her message.